Good morning. I wanted to share with you guys um, a little bit about the Miller family in Berlin. Um, Brian was able to email me this week and just give me a brief update so we could um, know how to be praying for them as they serve um, the people and serve God in Germany. Um, as you can imagine, um, they're dealing with some COVID restrictions over there, pretty tight lockdown from what from what he said. Um, sounds like they're not even allowed to have like more than one person in their home at a time. Um, there's a strict um, curfew um, between nine at night and five in the morning. You're not allowed to leave your home um, except for emergencies and um, N95 masks are required um, whenever they go out of their home. So some pretty strict um, lockdown that they're dealing with there. Um, but there's also some really exciting um, developments in their ministry there. Um, he is still able to meet with some of the refugee groups in Berlin there, so that's not completely closed down, which is definitely a praise. We can be thanking God for, for those ministry doors that are still open, even in the midst of such a strict lock, um, <clears throat> well, excuse me, strict lockdown there um, in Berlin. Um, and also, the Millers are looking at, um, they're in the process of establishing like a local nonprofit organization to um, help with their mission efforts there in Berlin. He says that um, he'll be sharing more with us in the future, but something we can be praying about that as they go through some of the red tape that's required to get something like that started, um, we can be praying that that would move through the system smoothly. Um, this is a nonprofit that um, he says will be significant for mobilizing more missionaries, not only into Berlin um, and within Berlin, but even sending some people out to other places. So we can be praying about the lockdown and be praying about the different ministry opportunities that they have. Um, he says also, please send our love and greetings to the Enclave family. We are so grateful for the partnership we have in the gospel. So let's pray for the Miller family even now. Father, thank you for your call um, to send out people into the world to share your love. Um, some of us are here in Turlock doing that, and some of us are around the world. And we thank you for the Millers going to Berlin to do that there. Um, we pray that during these COVID restrictions that you would continue to open doors for them to minister to refugees and to the people around them and to um, just share your joy and your love with those. Um, we pray for this nonprofit that they're um, in the process of starting and we pray that you would um, just remove all the different obstacles that go with um, government bureaucracy and red tape, God, and that you would make this happen quickly um, in a way that can bring um, more and more people to know you. We want to pray for um, Chuck as he comes and shares your word with us this morning. We pray that um, you would change us from the inside out as we hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning. Am, am, is my microphone on? Yes. Oh, good. Good. <clears throat> I happen to notice as I... Hello. Comedy is extra. <clears throat> I happen to notice as I came in that uh, they included a stopwatch. <laughs> as a public service, no doubt. <clears throat> I'd like to start out this morning by way of introduction with a little story about myself. Years and years ago, uh, about two decades actually, uh, I used to work for the Pleasanton Unified School District. And one of my jobs was to make deliveries to all of the high schools. 
well, all of the schools, actually. And uh, one particular high school was elevated. Okay, their elevation was such that they could look out across uh, Pleasanton, really cool view. But it also had a great view of the sunrise. And on this one particular morning, God was gracious. Uh, I pulled up to the high school right in the middle of the most incredible sunrise I had ever seen in my life. There was enough clouds for God to paint. There was golds and gray and pink and just all these colors. And I stood rooted to the spot. Seriously, I, I just stared for a couple of minutes at least. And uh, in fact, I, I've told people that I could almost hear angels singing. It was that incredibly beautiful. So I went about the rest of my morning with springs. I was bouncing. And I kept going into these schools saying, did you see that? Did you catch that sunrise? And I got, well, a variety of responses. Nope, didn't see it. Yeah, well, you know, it, it was kind of pretty. Um, what about it? <laughs> you know, I just got, I, I was so deflated, you know, because they didn't see what I saw. And uh, so I talked to my good friend and mentor, Roy Wiesner, and uh, he said very simply, they have a, co a completely different filter than what you have. Oh, well, I didn't really key in on what he was saying for several years, really. Uh, but as I learned and grew, I realized, yeah, I mean, they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. And the filter that they're looking through just doesn't let them see the handiwork that God had laid out. And I thought, wow, that's, that's kind of sad. And the longer I went on, the more I realized that Christians have filters too. I mean, if I started out this sermon by saying, this is going to be all about obedience. Okay, uh, people would maybe get up and leave. Or their brain, at least, would get up and leave. They, you know, pull out their cell phone and start playing a game. Oh, hang on. <clears throat> I wanted to turn my cell phone sound off. There. Okay. But they have filters, too. We have filters. Okay, maybe it was a tough childhood. Maybe it was, maybe it's current difficulties. Um, you name it. But we look at the scriptures with filters. Not saying it's good or bad. It can be difficult, but it's the fact. That's part of human nature. So John records Jesus talking to his disciples in John 14, verse 15. And he says... If you love me, obey my commandments. Hmm. If you love me, obey. He draws a connection between love and obedience. That's not the way we're used to looking at it. You know, we're used to looking at a list of rules. You do this, you don't do that. You don't do this other thing. You always do this thing and so on and so forth. And that's kind of how we're conditioned to respond. Um, psychologists would call that conditioned response. Duh. OK. But it's from the outside in. And it really doesn't accomplish much. It modifies our behavior, to some extent anyway. But it doesn't really leave a rooted change. The way Jesus put it, if you love me, obey my commands. Now, I think all of us here 
have been told at one time or another that Greek has three words that we translate love. Okay? You've got phileo, which has got nothing to do with filleted fish. It's brotherly love. That's where we get the town's name Philadelphia. Now, if, if you surf the net, <laughs> you, you realize that um, there's an irony there because uh, Philadelphians tend to um, work with one another to expedite their ex departure from this world, if you follow my meaning. They shoot each other. Um, so there's an irony there. But Philadelphia, family love, familial connections between brothers and sisters, um, all of that. There's eros, I'm not gonna go into detail, okay? Uh, and then there's agape. Jesus is saying, if you agape me, obey my commandments. Okay. Well, once upon a time when I was an undergraduate study, one of my professors said, Chuck, the best possible commentary on the scriptures is the scriptures. Okay. Undergrads are all about collecting books. And Bible college students, oh, yeah, we collect commentaries like nothing. And that's a, a badge of honor to us. But he said, the best commentary on the scriptures are the scriptures. So, with that thought in mind, I'd love for you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, before you panic, I'm not going to go through the whole chapter. Okay? But I will start you out looking at it with a new filter. All right? Remember, Jesus drew the connecting line between love and obedience, between agape and obedience. And 1 Corinthians 13 is all about agape, right? How many of you have been to a, a wedding in the last 50 years? <laughs> yeah. You've undoubtedly heard sermons on it, and uh, you've probably got a significant part of it committed to memory, or at least semi-committed. <laughs> Believe me, when you get to be my age, everything is semi-committed to memory. Um, but I'm going to read it to you out of the New Living Translation, and I'm going to read it to you with a different sort of a filter to it. I want you to follow along and think of it in a new way. If I, verse 1, if I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't obey Jesus, I would be a noisy gong or a clang, clanging cymbal noise. Now we, <laughs> we live in an age of man called the information age. For you youngsters, um, we had the stone age, we had the iron age, we had the bronze age, the industrial age, now we've got the information age. When I was a kid, when I was your age for instance, um, my parents were so proud of the fact that they bought us the Encyclopedia Britannica, the whole set, including yearbooks. And if I didn't start my research for school papers and stuff with those encyclopedias, I heard about it. We paid good money for those, blah, blah, you know. Now, I'm, well, I actually read that Encyclopedia Britannica is going out of print. They're going to be collector's items. Um, now it's GTS. Google that stuff. <laughs> right? We can learn whatever we need to know for life by pulling out our cell phone, our tablet, going to the internet, and look it up. The problem is, how do you know if what you're reading is trustworthy? I mean, I've got a slant. You've got a slant. Everybody out on the internet's got a slant. 
We have a point of view. And this side of the view and that side of the view don't appear. This is what we see. And the people on the internet, they show us what they want us to see. Okay? They speak the languages of the earth and of angels. And they're good. They're really convincing. There's also a lot of preachers, televangelists, who are also very convincing. In fact, they have teams of people editing their websites and so on and so forth so that everything is just so. It's presented the way they want it. It has the content that they have or that they want you to see and so on and so forth. So how do you know? Well, you got to look at their obedience. Do they walk the walk? Do they actually walk as Jesus told us to walk? In love, in humility, in grace, in generosity? Do they? Okay. There are televangelists out there that have two or three houses. And I say houses, I mean mansions. Okay. They drive one of five or six cars. They own a private jet or lease one. Okay. And all they've got excuses for all of this. Oh, this is for the ministry. This is for the ministry. That's a hard sell with me. Okay. And then you get others that uh, shall remain nameless. Yeah, they'll remain nameless who actually dilute the gospel and encourage a, kind of a partnership with Islam. They call it Chrislam, okay? And things like that. And you have to be careful because if they're not walking with Jesus, their message is noise. Don't we have enough of that? Really? I mean, I, I, yeah, I've got all kinds of noise. Um, verse 2. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't follow Jesus, I would be nothing. Now, some would say that Lucifer cannot do miracles. I say he doesn't need to. Think about it. He has been studying mankind since he was shoved out of heaven. And he's a real observer. He knows exactly how to deceive people and then how to accuse people once they've been deceived. So he plays it from both ends. And he's very, very efficient at what he does. It's just that simple. And people, people will often claim to know God's secret plan. And they will leave you with the impression that they possess all knowledge. But there again, do they walk the walk? Are they obedient to Jesus? If they're not, then you better kind of cast it aside and say, this is not worth my time. This is just not doing it for me. Verse 3, if I give everything to the poor and even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't obey Jesus, I would have gained nothing. Zippo, zilch, nada. Okay, people are capable, people, just unregenerated people, are capable of doing some remarkable things, amazing stuff, stuff that I wouldn't do. But if they're not obeying Jesus, then they haven't gained anything. Now, that's all kind of out there. That's instructions on how you deal with the world, obedience should be a filter for
for all of us. Verse 4, obedience is patient and kind. Here's where it starts to get personal. Some people have said, okay, how much patience do I need to have with others and myself? That's a fair question. Fair answer. You only need to be as patient as God has been with you. Piece of cake, right? I mean, can you imagine it? You come to the Lord. He says, welcome home, son. Now, we have some things that we need to address. And he goes through the first page. And he says, wait, wait, there's more. Goes through the second, the back of the first page, right? And he keeps going and going and going. Remember, Jesus is God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's aware of what went on before time began. And he knows your last heartbeat. And you're listening to page after page after page of issues that Jesus wants you to deal with. He's paid for them, but you've got to deal with them. And you're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And by the time you're on, he's on his second ream or second case of paper, poof, you've disappeared. That's not how it works, is it? Jesus has paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He does deal with sin. He's dealt with me. He's, he'll deal with you. But he's patient. He knows your very first heartbeat and your very last breath. He knows exactly what to deal with and when to deal with it. And he doesn't stray from that timeline. You can't rush him. Okay? Obedience is patient. Obedience is also kind. This deals with a lot of how we treat one another. Yeah, I've overcome this sin and that sin and this other thing. How come you haven't? Okay? Or look at you. You've overcome this and this and this, and I'm still struggling with it. Okay? Kindness works both ways. It flows in both directions. And obedience, godly obedience, is kind. Now, I want to stop here for a minute and remind you there's two kinds of obedience. There's the kind that comes from the outside and goes in. That's tyranny. That's a Pharisee. That's behavior modification, right? And then there's the other kind that blossoms out of agape. That's the kind that we're after. That's the kind that we work toward. And we push toward. But that obedience is patient and kind. That obedience, love, is not jealous or boastful or proud. Now, um, a small part of me kind of enjoys it when what went around comes around. I admit it. Okay, it's, it's a flaw. God is still dealing with it. And he's going to keep dealing with it for the rest of my life, I think. But obedience is not jealous. It isn't boastful or proud or rude. And to skip down a little bit, it isn't irritable obedience. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. Okay, now we're dealing with a lot of human nature here. We want to succeed. We don't like feeling foolish 
or stepping in the same steaming pile of sin that we stepped in last week. It's not fun, is it? I don't enjoy it. You know, I, and the devil comes along inside and says, hey, Chuck, good job. You did it again. Okay, that's point of his duties. He's uh, the deceiver, and he's also the accuser. Okay, failing is no fun at all. Re uh, succeeding is great. Everybody loves to be a winner. But when it comes to obedience, the obedience of love, we don't cheer for ourselves and snicker at the people who failed. We rejoice at the people who succeed and we pray for everybody else, including ourselves. Okay? It doesn't rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. <sighs> Love never gives up. Neither does obedience. Okay? It, it never gives up. It never loses faith. It always, it is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. <sighs> That's kind of a high mark, don't you think? I know it is for me. It feels very, very high. Like I'm trying to high jump these, these bars here. Okay? But obedience that is born out of love amazes you. And it gives you a strength and an energy toward Christ that law is never going to do. You know, the, the brutality of lists, you know, is just abhorrent to me. But the success of Obedience out of love is incredibly powerful. It's incredibly encouraging. Okay? Like I've said before, we are not going to step into eternity smoking hot from everything that Christ has burned away that we didn't get handled here. Okay? You struggle with sin, you struggle with sin. You keep struggling throughout your life. You finally breathe your last, and God deals with everything that's left. I used to snicker and say laughingly, yeah, he does, and I'll step through those pearly gates, still smoking hot from everything that he's had to deal with. But I want to tell you this for your encouragement. John reports in the book of Revelation that God is going to dry every tear. We're not going to drag across those, that threshold with our head hung low, remembering all of the stuff that we've failed at. He's going to dry every tear. If there are any tears, and you know that I know I'm contradicting myself, if there are any tears, they're going to be tears of joy at what God has done for us through Christ. No regrets, no denial, no guilt. It will all have been dealt with. Now, there's more of the chapter, but I'm not going to cover it this morning because I would encourage you to look at it, look at the rest of the chapter, look at the whole chapter through a new lens because we are not all about rules and regs, and thou shalt nots, and so on and so forth. We are about the love of our Savior who paid it all. Okay? That's what drives us forward. That's what motivates us. And the results of, those, of that motivation is so much more. Remember just in closing, remember the, the prodigal son? That story? Okay? How the, the prodigal comes home and he's 
in need of grace and he knows it. He has failed his father and he knows it. And the father runs out and hugs him and throws a party because what was lost has now been found. Think about the older brother. Okay, he, he's resentful. He does not understand why the father is doing all of this for that, that brat. Now, I've got brothers. I've got three older brothers. And yeah, I could relate. But <laughs> he just doesn't get it. He doesn't get what God's doing. Because all my life, as he says... I've, I've worked for you, Father, and I've followed the orders, and look at what I've done for you. I've been faithful. And the Father says, yep, come into the party, would you? No. Come into the party, would you? No. That's the difference between obedience that comes from the outside, that's forced on you, and obedience that springs out of love. Okay? We love him because he first loved us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, give us clarity in the way we look at your commands. Give us understanding, please, about how to apply those commands as we walk through life. Lord, you've put us in an exciting, dynamic, scary time of the world. But you're coming back, and you're coming back soon, I think. But whether we come to meet you or you call us out to meet you in the air, we're in some exciting times, Lord. Please give us the grace to hang on to everything you've taught us. Give us the understanding to trust you through all those situations. We love you, Lord. Amen.